Have you ever encountered a situation like this? Your hands are full of grocery bags. You get to a door. You realize there's no way you can open that doorknob without putting the stuff down. In that case, it's possible you've encountered a round doorknob. For many people, encountering a door without an easily operable lever is usually just a minor inconvenience. But for people with manual dexterity limitations, hand injuries, and other related disabilities, a round doorknob may prevent them from being able to go through that door. If that door had a lever-style handle, it could be operable with a closed fist or even an elbow, making it much more accessible to people with or without disabilities. Similarly, even though power door operators are often designed for people with disabilities, the reality is that they make going through a door easier for all kinds of people, including people using wheelchairs, crutches, and walkers, people carrying a handful of shopping bags, parents with strollers, and delivery people carrying boxes or pushing trolleys. I'm an interior designer, and I often think about how everyday environments could be improved with good design, from overall circulation flows throughout spaces to details like door hardware. And a part of good design is having the awareness and consideration for people of different abilities. While many accessible design components may have initially been designed with disabilities in mind, the vast majority of accessible improvements to products, fixtures, and environments actually end up providing better access for everyone. Automatic toilet flushes, faucets, and soap dispensers are easier to use for people who cannot reach or cannot operate levers, buttons, and valves, but it also makes using a washroom more sanitary and more convenient for most people. Visually contrasting flooring transitions, tactile warning strips, and cane-detectable barriers help many people, whether they have a visual impairment or not, to see and detect oncoming hazards more easily. Over the last few decades, some designers have also adopted the principles of universal design, which is a design approach that considers many different human factors, including abilities, age, genders, and cultural backgrounds. Universal design reframes the approach to how we think about people with disabilities, where their needs are not seen as special circumstances, but as a part of many different human factors that require consideration. For instance, drinking fountains, lavatories, and service counters with high and low surfaces, or desks and tables where the heights are adjustable, are not only designed for the use of wheelchair users, but also for children, older adults, people of different heights, and people with different usage preferences. Simple, easily navigable wayfinding with visual and tactile signage help people with visual and auditory impairments, but can also improve the experiences of people who speak different languages and people with cognitive disabilities. Universal toilet rooms can accommodate not only wheelchair users, but also individuals traveling with caregivers of the same or opposite gender, families with children, as well as people who prefer to use non-gendered washrooms. Often the concept of providing accommodations to disabled people is misunderstood as making disabled people dependent on society to help them, when in fact accommodating disabilities is pretty much the opposite of that. While some disabled people do require caretakers or guide animals to help them with their day-to-day -day life, the goal of accessible design is actually to provide independence for people with disabilities. If we provide ways for people to independently open doors, go up levels, use the toilet, get around safely, obtain services, and find information, basically go about their day-to-day -day life like most other people, then technically they're not disabled anymore. It's important to realize that traditionally we have built our environments to exclude certain people. Disabilities are not inherently possessed by the individual. They're shaped by the barriers we have put up. While it's obviously not practical to immediately rebuild everything, there are still things we can do and steps we can take to remove these barriers. Some may argue that designing and building accessible products and environments can be costly. While that may be true in some circumstances, when it comes to building new spaces and creating new products, there is often not a cost difference to implementing accessible features. Choosing a more visually contrasting color at a change in floor level usually costs nothing as long as the product is the same, and installing one type of door lever over another will result in minimal price differences, if any. But of course, there are still costs to some accessible features, and the retrofitting of existing non-accessible spaces could have a high initial cost. However, in many cases, it is arguably more economically detrimental to ignore accessibility. 
According to the World Health Organization, around 15% of the world's population live with disabilities, a percentage that's expected to rise in most developed nations due to the increase in the older adult populations. Communities and businesses all benefit from the participation of people with disabilities, as consumers as well as being productive members of the workforce. Even in private homes, inaccessible design will also directly and indirectly cost individuals money, such as in the loss of productivity, as well as in the cost of caretakers or people taking time off work to care for disabled family members. By building spaces that accommodate people with disabilities, we can provide them with economic empowerment and independence. And in most cases, we will also improve the quality of life for just about everybody. If you look at it this way, accessible design may just be one of the most morally and fiscally responsible things we can do. So what do you think? What are some design improvements that you think would benefit accessibility and usability in your life? Whether it's at home, work, school, or a public space? Leave your thoughts in the comments below. Thanks for watching. This video is a part of a series where I discuss the various aspects of the interior design profession. If you're interested, here are some more videos to check out and please subscribe for more. Until next time.